I watch an obscene amount of television and it's probably better for me to use my time more productively, so I'm gonna talk about the television that I watch. The last few days of May witnessed two major progresses of our journey to the space, of the launch of Crew Dragon and Netflix Space Force. One of them is a huge success, the other one not so much. Created by Steve Carell and Greg Daniels, Space Force is facing a huge wave of harsh criticism. Turns out that when you put these two names together and use The Office as a major marketing highlight, people expect something from the show. And so when they got whatever the shit Space Force is, they get really disappointed. I finished the show in 10 days, and I have to say that there are some highlights of the show. For example, I like the casting a lot. Uh, my favorite character is Ben Schwartz's, ben Schwartz's character. Ben Schwartz's character, F. Tony, or fuck Tony. This video is not gonna get monetized anyways. So fuck Tony. He is a really, really funny character. Ben Schwartz brought his energy into this, and he made this character so out of the world. And he's probably the most satirical character in this show, even though he probably shouldn't be since he's not the main character and he is kind of a comedic relief. But in the meantime, why would you need a comedic relief in a comedy? Another thing I really like about this show is that it finally has some good representation in a show produced by two white dudes. So thank you, Greg Daniels and Steve Carell. Jimmy O. Yan's character in Space Force is a really refreshing Asian representation in a show not designated to tell POC stories. He has a personality, even though he appears to be a really nerdy Asian scientist. He likes anime and K-pop and drives a pickup truck. And he doesn't take no bullshit from no one. He stands up against all the microaggressions thrown at him, and I love that about his character. I think that's a really huge leap from Jimmy Wan's character in Silicon Valley, who is pretty awful. Eric Bachman, this is your mom, and you, you are not my baby. Not now, Jin Yang, not now! Go back into your room! The show also looks really, really nice, again, thanks to the big budget and the really talented directing team. The show's directors include Dee Reese, who directed Mudbound, uh, Dinah Reed, I hope I'm pronouncing the name right, from Handmaid's Tale, and um, Paul King, who directed Paddington. With a directing team like this, the show really has gone beyond just a comedy series. It is a cinematic masterpiece with all the beautiful shots and um, the really emotional scores. I think the biggest criticism against Space Force is that it's trying too hard to be too many things, which just ended up undermining what matters the most. Comedy. In 2018, Steve Carell reached out to his old pal Greg Daniels about the idea of making a workplace comedy based on President Trump's visionary plan of building a Space Force. So judging from the conceit of this show, it's supposed to be a workplace political satire that criticizes American idiocy and American exceptionalism by depicting a really dysfunctional branch of the highest level of American authorities. The show did kind of do that by showing how ridiculous it is to build um, a habitat on the moon in just a couple of years. How much was that prototype? Four million? Middle schools. Cost as much as four new middle schools. In fact. However, the show is also trying to be a gazillion other things at the same time, so incorporated a lot of subplots. There's Mark Nery's family line, Aaron's vague romance, and Dr. Che and, and Captain Ali's um, comradeship or romance, whatever you call it. All these subplots don't really have anything to do with the main goal of the workplace, which is building a human habitat on the moon. I think a lot of plot points in the main quest of putting boots on the moon can actually be extended instead of jumping to subplots. Really don't see that much of how problems are solved, they just cease to be an issue when we come back from a subplot. 
For example, in episode 8, we see Dr. Mallory, played by John Malkovich, was trying to gather a group of people to um, live on the moon. And he got rejected by the first person he reached out to. And then we cut to Mark's conjugal visit for 10 minutes. When we come back, problem solved. Let's just get these two random people to up and live in the moon. No problem. As a workplace comedy slash political satire, it really should be focusing on the main quest and how problems on the main quest are solved. The subplots should be used to push forward the main plot. However, here in Space Force, these subplots just end up being their own stories that has nothing to do with the workplace. The show got sucked into an identity crisis trying to decide if it should be a workplace comedy or political satire or a heartwarming dramedy that looks very nice. Looking at the show as a whole, it seems like the only thing that's pushing forward this whole mission to put people on the moon is actually China. Motherfucker! So here's a little something about me. I am a Chinese citizen and I was born and raised in China. However, I did grow up watching a lot more uh, Western entertainment than Chinese ones. So I can say that I have a pretty good appreciation of Western humor when it comes to jokes about China. It has become a trend in political satires to make fun of China. And to be honest, I'm all for a good China joke. After all, I didn't come to America for castrated comedies. With that said, I do have a problem with uh, Space Force portraying China as a big fat liar. In my opinion, in this day and age, the general rule of thumb for tastefully making fun of other countries in a political satire is two birds with one stone. You know, you make fun of others while obviously making fun of yourself. Fink did a really good job doing that. It established Selena Meyer as a really unlikable American politician who's super incompetent. The level of incompetence in this office is staggering! So when she used China's cyber attack as an excuse for her fuck-ups, it's actually a joke on both China and America. As you know, earlier this week, the White House was subjected to a highly sophisticated cyber attack originating in mainland China. This incursion is just the latest instance in what has been a disturbing pattern of provocative behavior by the Chinese government. However, Space Force failed in doing so. Steve Carell has a record for playing likable douche, and the show kind of established him as a very straightforward, very upright person, and he didn't have any skeletons in the closet. So when we see the Chinese space station take apart the American satellite that Mark Narod worked so hard to build, we feel bad for Mark and American Space Force. And we start to hate on China for fictionally doing so. Like I said, the show did a really good job creating likable characters, but the downside is that it makes satire really, really difficult because we hate to see them in a bad situation and have that shot of ruined moment. Therefore, when China built a moon base before America, or when China refused to let Space Force One land, we just hate on China for doing that. The main function of China as a saboteur is simply to push forward the plot. You can argue that this is supposed to be a joke on American exceptionalism, but it's really not. A satirical joke on American exceptionalism is supposed to show people that American exceptionalism is bad and maybe Americans should be a little more humble. Oftentimes, other satirical shows do so by making the sabotaged character fundamentally flawed or unlikable and force them to accept the lesson that maybe America isn't the greatest, or at least make it clear to the audience that this should be the lesson. For example, in the 30 Rock episode Double Edged Sword, Jack Donaghy learned to yield to his belief in American exceptionalism by putting his wife Avery's um, health as a priority and let his daughter be born Canadian. That was 
genius. A satirical joke on American exceptionalism and American idiocy ends in acceptance and a change in perspective. However, somehow Space Force's approach to joking on China and American exceptionalism is making China the obstacle and pushing the characters to overcome that. Hence proving that despite some hiccups, America is still the best. It's simply self-defeating in its purpose as a workplace political satire when it ends up upholding the very thing that it's trying to make fun of. I get it. Space Force is supposed to be witty about America, spending so much money on useless military shit. But like, why did I end up rooting for Space Force? Because who wouldn't like Steve Carell? as the big daddy of Space Force. When I said fuck Tony is the most satirical character of the entire show, I meant that he is the most dysfunctional one of the team. And you get why he exists. He is there to make fun of the futile and yet chaotic PR efforts of the American government. Similarly, you also get the satire from the Joint Chiefs and the Secretary of Defense because they are just so unapologetically awful. I think the problem with Space Force is actually that Steve Carell is too obsessed with his wholesomeness and his dignity to get down and dirty with a genre like this. It could have been a great workplace political satire had it stuck to the concept, but somehow Greg Daniels and Steve Carell had to make emotional and touching with all unnecessary scores and subplots. It's really a pity. However, Greg Daniels is also known for shows that get better with time, so I really do hope that Space Force can get a second season to redeem itself. And that's it for part one of how not to make a workplace political satire. If you want more, please like and share this video, leave a comment below, and subscribe to my channel. See you soon.